Alhamdulillah, he was Allah who was Salam Alan, and being a Muhammad and Wala, and he was happy at my. Inshallah, today we'll get pick, uh, started up where we left off in the Kitab al Sam, or Kitab al Siam. So, uh, we last talked about uh, the many things that break the person's fast. And of course, like the biggest, the biggest like uh, keystone that you could get from that, there are the, anything that enters into one of the, the passages of the body intentionally breaks the fast. Like if it enters into one of those major passages, like the jof, um, that goes into a place that is taking nourishment, uh, such as like the, the belly and whatnot, or the lungs, then this is something that will, would break the, the fast. And so then he also talked about what happens if somebody, um, if somebody does jima' in the, the day of Ramadan, they break their fast with jima'. Um, and then he talked about the kafara, and he, he brought this with its, um, uh, with its uh, details of how someone would go about doing that. Uh, and so the next thing uh, that we'll, we'll pick up there is whoever, he says here, Rahimahullah, وَمَنْ مَاتَ وَعَلَيْهِ السِّيَامٌ مِنْ رَمَضَانٌ uh, so he says here, whoever, whoever dies and he has some that he hasn't done yet. So like there's some that he hasn't paid off yet. Uh, and of course, like someone who misses one of these things and they need to pay, they, it's kind of like a debt that's in there, it's, that's uh, on them for them to repay this day. And so, of course, everyone should pay. Uh, everyone should pay, or like everyone should um, fast all of the things that are upon them before the next Ramadan comes. So each each Ramadan, you should have already fasted all the things before you before this next Ramadan comes. And so he says here, and whoever died, and upon him siyam, and in Ramadan, utayma anhu min mut. So whoever uh, passed away and he had um, some that he needed to do. Then, then he says here, anhu, which means that he is fed on behalf of him. Like it's fed on behalf of him, or like they give out food on behalf of him. And likulli yom, for every single day, muddun. And uh, mud is, uh, if we talked about sa'a, a sa'a is, uh, uh, is for mud. And so here he talks about mud, and the mud is the, what is that, 3.2 cups. Um, uh, roughly, or seven, seven or fifty-seven milliliters, and this is the the mud that is um, that is actually like if you go to Medina, they actually have a mud there that they have ascended for this actual um, for this actual like uh, measurement that comes all the way from the time of the like the Sahaba and whatnot in Medina. So this is we go back to this, and this is a volumetric measurement, and so this is what we'd go. A lot of times, um, people that go there they will weigh certain things so that they can figure out, okay, this is the mud and how much is it and, and whatnot. But of course, it's a volumetric measurement. So anything we take into it, it, we need to make sure that it volumetrically follows us, even if it's a little more because we're doing weight instead. Okay, that's a little extra to be careful to make sure that it wouldn't be less. But the, the basis is volumetric. So he says for every single um, person, uh, for every single day, uh, one person is fed a mud. And so, like that, the mud of Tom, and this is this is the view um, that is that is here uh, that he that he gives, and this is of the views in the Shafi'i Madhab, and also there's another view in the Shaf in the Shafi'i Madhab that is uh, that it's allowed for someone to fast on behalf of that person, so he can make up the fasting for him instead of paying the, the mud. One of the views is that he needs to pay the mud, and this is the the view that uh, Abu Shuja he brought here. Um, and of the other views that holds more weight um, when, when we look at the, the evidence, um, because the, the Prophet he was asked about, a, a woman asked him about um, that there was hajj upon her mother, and she said, uh, should I make hajj for her? And the Prophet said, and uh, uh, he asked her, hey, do you know if you had a dane that you needed to pay, uh, that your mother had? And then she passed away. Wouldn't, wouldn't you pay it? And, and she said, of course. And he said, uh, And so like, so like the, the dain or like the thing that is upon us to pay back for a lot is more important for us to pay um, than like even the people around us and whatnot. So of course, this is for hajj. But also if this was for, for some, this is also another one that there's also um, evidence uh, in, this, in this matter. And it's like, it's like hajj because this is something that is, um, that is done. And so people can do this as well. Um, so people, anyone from their family could fast on behalf of the person who passed away and had some that was upon them. And, um, and if someone outside of the family wanted to fast on their behalf, they would get someone from the family's permission. So they'd ask someone in the family, is it okay if I fast a couple days on behalf of so-and-so? And they'd be like, okay. 
and they just need to get the, the permission just so um, they do that for them. And this is um, this is the actual, like sometimes there'll be um, views in the Medhem that they give the fatwa, and this is the, the view that gives this actual fatwa uh, is for for this. And this is actually the Qadim. Like this is the old view of Imam al-Shafi, but it actually is held up stronger by the Dalil, by the evidence. So um, this is uh, Allah al-Qadim, then someone can fast on behalf of him. And so, uh, and this is a strong view. <coughs> and so, uh, so he says also, and he, he mentioned here, min Ramadan. So he said, وَمَنْ عَلَيْهِ سِيَامٌ مِنْ رَمَضَانَ أُطْعِمَ And so, min Ramadan, this is not necessarily, um, like it's not a qaid. It's not something that is limited to the Ramadan. Rather, it's any fasting that it's on him. Whether it's from Ramadan or from uh, something other than Ramadan, say he broke a, he, he broke a vow or something, he needed to, to fast for that. Or any of the other fasting things that come on, there's any any of them. Their family can fast for them, or they can give out the mut um, on the on the new. Like this is the 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 view on the new madhab. Wallah um, ta'ala a'lam. And he also says here, the next next thing he's going to go into is he says, "Wa shaykhu in ajza ani somi yuftiro wa yutrimu an kulli an kulli yomin mudda." And so he says here, "Wa shaykh." And the shaykh is someone that's big, older. Uh, it's like kabir sin. That's the like linguistically, a shaykh is someone who has who has like gone over like fifty years old, and someone who is like a, still a young. So you have like a tifl, which is like a, a young, young, young child, and then you would also have um, you would have like a uh, you have so you have like a tifl, or you'd have like janine, of course, and then you would have and then it would come up to like tifl, and then after tifl, then you would have like someone who's like a murahak, who's mumayyiz, and then after that you would have shab. And so Shab is like a young man. And then once he gets a little older and he comes into his 30s, then he's called a Kahan. So I'm like Kahan, uh, which is a Kahan is a, someone who is like, they're not middle aged, but they're like, they're, they're actually like their 30s up to like 40s and whatnot. And then when they're 40s, then they're a Rajal. Then after they're Rajal, then they become Sheikh. Uh, and so this is like in the in the fifties once they've gone over the hill and whatnot, then they would be considered sheikh. And here, what he means by sheikh is he means like someone who is uh, who is old, who is elderly, and he can't quite take it. He says in ages on his own. And so like if he can't like if he's old and whatnot, maybe he has medications, maybe he has a uh, he has to drink water. You know, like he can't go this long without water. He's going to go into some serious hardship, um, and he has like um, serious issues that would happen if he did this. Okay, there's no problem with that. Yuftir wa yutrimu an kulli yomin mut. And so so he breaks his fast. Yuftir uh, he, he breaks his fast wa yutrim an kulli yomin mutta. And so he can break his fast, and and every single day that he breaks his fast, then um, then he would give one mut. For in in uh, like in in response for that uh, in replacement of that, so he'd give one wood to someone every single thing, and so this is also very important. The people who will do break their fast, they do need to make sure that they're giving this, and this is um, this is a very important thing. I've I've seen some people that have gone years and they didn't know. So of course, this is important that people know. Like you know, if you're breaking your fast, you have to give, and you're in this kind of condition, you need to make sure that you get fast. If someone is say they're like an old person and they every single like every 12 hours they need to have medication, you know, then this can be very hard for them to fast on Ramadan, because most of the time the fasting is going to be more than 12 hours, and if they have to have it every 12 hours, this can be an issue. So if they do find a time in the in the year where they can fast, then they can fast in that time. And they can make that up, you know, like there's a time of the year when it's short, the days are short, they can make it up on that, on, on those days, such as like right now, maybe they can do that, you know, and so this is, this is one way to look at it. If they're able to fast in another time of the year, but they can't fast at that time of the year, then they break their fast and then they fast at the other time of the year if they're able, or they give the, um, they give the mud if they're, if they're just unable to fast at any time. So um, this is when it comes to the sheikh, and this is the same also, uh, this is for the sheikh, and the reason is because he can't make up this day. In general, this is the one who can't fast at all. So he, since he can't make up this day, he, he would give this. And this is, um, this is from the, the ayat, And so this also has been, uh, like, uh, it has been, there's another, like, recitation, which is not necessarily of the mutawatir uh, recitations, but yutawakuna. Yutawakuna means, like, that's hardship on them. And so this this recitation, which we wouldn't necessarily say in and of itself, is we we take like the shad uh, uh, um, qiraat, we take them for for ahkam, 
sometimes. Like sometimes we'll take this as ahkam, as it's like a, this is something that is um, still there. Um, but a lot of times, uh, even though we don't recite them as Quran, it's still at the same level as hadith. If it came to us with, with a solid chain of narration, then we still take it as like a hadith, you know, so we still use it. Uh, um, and of course, so he says, uh, so this is the evidence for it. Uh, so this is of the um, different, um, like, kira'at. Um, and so this is also the same thing. We'll come into the next area, and this goes back to the same ayah, actually. He um, says here, وَالْحَامِلُ وَالْمُرْدِعُ إِنْ خَافَتَ عَنْ أَنفُسِهِمَا أَفْتَرَتَا وَعَلَيْهِمَا الْقَضَاءُ and so al-hamil, of course, there's no um, there's no temur buta out here, like there's no uh, temur buta. And why is that? Because this is something that's specific for a woman. There's not going to be a you're not you don't need the temur buta yet uh, Like this comes so that we can separate it from the male. But of course, we're not going to have any pregnant male, so we don't need the temur buta. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with tahir and ha'id. You won't see ha'id. You never see a temur buta ha'ida. No, it's just ha'id. You know, because this is something that's specific for the women. We don't need the the meaning is enough for us to to know that this is feminine. We don't need an actual temur buta to come and break it from the to separate the male from the female. So that's the same thing. Al hamil wal murdeo, and al murdeo is the is like the 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 breastfeeding woman. When the hamil is the uh, the pregnant woman. So the, the pregnant woman, the breastfeeding woman, إِذَا خَافَتَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمَا أَفْتَرَتَ وَعَلَيْهِمَا الْقَضَىٰ And so he says, if they fear for them, uh, they fear for their own selves. Like, and of course, like a woman, when she's going through uh, a pregnancy, a lot of times she can be a much more weak. Maybe she has problems eating, all kinds of problems that come up. And so if she fears for her own health, then she's just like a sick person. So she breaks her fast and she makes it up when she can. And there's and she just needs to make it up. That's why he says wa um, And this is if they fear for their their own their own selves. Um, and so and also this is the same with the bre- the, the the breastfeeding woman. This is the same thing because she gets a lot of there's a lot of like just energy that's drained and also like breastfeeding takes a lot. So if they fear for themselves their own sickness, then they just make up the days that they break the fast for. And so there's another situation. He says wa in and he means al fidya. I'm here, but he says so. In, and if they fear for their um, for their kids alone, like if they don't fear for themselves, but rather they fit for, they fear for their kids' safety. You know, like maybe she's pregnant and there might be a problem with the baby, uh, but she's fine. Like she's not in any uh, like any like any type of health health um, distress or anything. She's fine. Health. She's fine. Healthy. She's not gonna hurt. It's not gonna hurt her. But she's worried about the baby. Then um, she can break her fast. And the same thing for the the morda. And uh, the the morda, she can if she's um, breastfeeding, and she knows she's gonna be just fine if she if she like fasts. But she's worried that she's not gonna have enough milk for the kid. So in this case, um, they can break their fast, but since they did this not for themselves, they're not fearing for themselves, they're fearing for someone else, and then they would, um, they would need to do the, the, the fidya. And he says here, uh, al-qada, they need to make it up, and they also have, he says, wal kafara. This kafara is not the kafara that we talked about for the person who broke the, uh, this is different, this is the fidya, which is the, the mud. And he says, an kulli yawmin muddun, and then he gives the, uh, and so that's for every single day they do this, one mut. Um, and so this is also going back to the ayah. وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَنْتُمْ تُعَامُ مِسْكِينَ So this is, um, this is for the people. يُطِيقُونَهُ Of course this ayah has, there's a lot of talk about the tafsir of it. Uh, but of the meanings of this ayah, where at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of uh, fasting, the, the sahaba were given a choice whether or not they wanted to fast or not. So they could either fast, or they could, uh, or they would choose not to fast. And so the people who chose that they were not going to fast, uh, and they're able to fast, then they needed to give the fidya. And so this meaning of the ayah has been mansukh. Uh, uh, and so, so whoever has seen in, from this ayah, it says like nobody has a choice in the matter anymore. But the meaning here, there's another meaning. Whoever is able to, um, whoever is able to fast. And they break their fast, then um, they um, then they need to give a fidya. And so this is this is the other this is the one here which comes into that woman. She's able to fast, 
she has an excuse to break her fast for the for the kids' safety, you know. So she breaks her fast, but it's not for her own sickness; it's for someone else's. So she has the fitya. She still falls into this, and this is this uh, aspect of the ayah is not mansukh. But that other aspect of the ayah is mansukh. And so sometimes you'll have an ayah where part of it is mansukh. Like some of the meanings. It'll hold multiple meanings. And part of the, um, the meanings of that it holds are mansukh. And the other signs are uh, muhkim. And this is like the view of the Shafi Madhab. Is this, is, this is muhkim when it comes to this. Um, when it comes to this meaning. And this is also the, the view of some of the, the Salaf as well. Um, and the Sahaba. And so here, that's that's what we have here. So every single day that she does this, she she can, she needs to make it up, and she also needs to uh, to break her fast. And this goes for anyone who breaks their fast for someone else's sake. So uh, we talked about someone who's um, um, someone who's um, swimming. Then this is something they'll break their fast, and they and if they got water into their mouth, then they broke their fast, and blah blah blah. So what if you saw someone drowning? You gotta go, or you saw like a like an animal struggling in the water, and you need to go save that animal. You know, like this is something Sharia, like that's upon you to do. So you go do this, and even if you broke your fast, then you would make up the fast. And you would also have the fidya, because you're able to fast, but you broke your fast for someone else's sake. So um, this is also like that. And then he goes into what is the actual mud. He says, "An kulli yomin muddun wa huwa ritrun wa thuluthu wa thuluthun and bil Iraqi." And so this is the ritul is a was a known measurement at the time of like the the author here, and this is something you'll see a lot in like the books of fiqh. They'll talk about uh, ritul, and this is a um, a weight measurement. So they did a conversion um, here from biometric to weight, and then uh, and did that. And like as I mentioned before, this in the biometric measurement, it's two, uh, it's point um, two uh, liters. I mean point two gallons, or it's three point uh, two cups or it's 757 uh, milliliters. And so these are the, the, the rough, uh, rough estimates. And some, of the, some other people have done um, like HD hat and whatnot and come up with different, uh, different numbers from this. And, um, but since we have the actual kale, like we have the actual, um, we have the actual uh, mud and sa from the time of the Prophet and we go back to that, and we just uh, we, uh, we look at that and we see what is this what is this type of thing weigh in it, and you can do the weight from that. If you do a weight conversion, how much does um, short grain rice weigh in it? And then you can see, and you can do that. But of course, um, being on the safe side, make sure that you always have the right volume amount when anything of the that comes in mud. And really, it's about it's about uh, a mud is like a handful, like a big handful. It's kind of like the amount that you would have. <clears throat> now, like have two hands together, two hands together. Like this is about a mud. Like if you piled up um, uh, food in your hands, so that's about a mud. And so the and also this um, the the fidya it goes to the fuqara and the masakin. So it goes to the the fuqara and the masakin. This is what the fidya is for, and um, and of course, like the the fakir is is in a is more needy state than the masakin. So of course, like giving it to him. Of course, when it comes to fidya tun ta'amu miskin, so we'd say the fakir is more needing of it than the miskin. So he comes into it, of course, um, from that from the ayah. And then the, the last thing he's going to talk about here in the, the chapter of Psalm, he says, "Well, married one musafiru and safran tawilan yuftirani wa yaqdayani." And so he says here the the marid, the person who's sick, they have something that's going to be very hard for them to continue fasting. It's going to be a serious hardship on them for them to fast while they're doing this. And of course, it's a it's a sickness that ca- that affects the fasting. It's not just any type of sickness. Maybe they're they're sick and fasting is the best thing for them. You know, is this person allowed to break their fast? No, it's the one who's sick with the fast, uh, is sick with the sickness that's going to affect the ability for him to fast, and it's going to make his fast harder on him than it should be. Um, so, in this case, this is the marid that I was talking about here. He can break his fast, uh, and also the musafir, uh, the the person who's on a, a long trip, safran tawilan. This is the trip that he can um, shorten his salat in, which is like more than fifty three miles, like uh, fifty three miles one way. And so if he's on a trip that is more than that, then he can break his fast. As long as he's uh, a musafir that can um, shorten his uh, salah, he can also break his fast in that. And the, the difference here for him, he can break his fast, but if it's not hard for him to fast, it's better for him to fast. So then he gets the benefit of being in Ramadan. Like fasting in Ramadan with everybody, this is a benefit that is, he's going to miss it if he breaks his fast. 
So like it's better for him to, to fast in Ramadan if he can, as long as it's not going to be hard on him. If it's going to be like seriously hard, then it's best for him to break his fast, you know, um, because Allah doesn't need that hardship on us, that unnecessary hardship. And, and so they, they, when he says Yuf Durani, yeah, it's like for the person, if they want to, then they can break their fast, and they, they break their fast, and they, um, and they just make it up later. And so the, and he doesn't mention here any, uh, any fidya, and there's no fidya on them, unless they delay their paying back of the fast. If they um, delay paying back the fast before the next Ramadan, then every single day that they, del every single day that they delayed past that Ramadan, they would have to pay a fidya for that day because they delayed it. They were able to fast and they didn't fast, so then they would have to, um, they would have to pay a fidya for that. And so this is the, and this is for the marid musafir, uh, and these two are, they're allowed to break their fast in that time. And also, like the the marid is someone who, um, if someone like got into a serious, serious, like, they were just so, so, so thirsty, they felt just like they're going to faint or something. This person is sick at this point. And they, they take the, even if they're not, like, they don't have some other sickness, but rather they just, and they, they are just so, like, parched, they're going to die. Or they feel like it's, it's just such a hard thing, then they can do this. Uh, like, they can, uh, they can drink, and they fall into the category of a marid at that point. What about somebody, like, they work a very labor-intensive job, and it's like all day. It's like 95 degrees up. If they're going to die or fall over of heat stroke, that's something, yeah. yeah I mean, I, and we wouldn't say that the person is, is a sinful for working. You wouldn't say the person is sinful for working. Like, he should, if, he's gonna, if he can do it, then he should try. So like, he, he would fast. He would fast until the point that he, he felt like he was actually to that, that place of sickness. Mm -hmm. And then in that case, he can break it, but he has to make it up, you know. How would he do that though? Like on the, just like on the weekends and just how did he? Uh, how do you break it, break the fast no, or if, if, if the work is year round? Like, mm, yeah, lower. Does he get out like he, He's got to he's got to fast it though. Eventually he's got to fast it. So of course, like you know, of course, people can figure out ways within there. Maybe they work at nights. You know, sometimes people work at nights for Ramadan. Um, if they know that this is going to be a hardship, they, they'll switch around like the heavy uh, work, labor intensive jobs. But of course, yeah, he has to make it up. Even if he's always going to work, he has to make it up. Like there's no, um, there's nothing of that. He can't get out of it just because um, that his job's hard. And so, <clears throat> also the, the next thing he's going to go into is not necessarily um, related to Soma in and of itself, but it's related to Ramadan. So it's, it's brought in at the end. It's Ali Atikaf. And so he says, Fasan, Rahimullah, Wali Atikaf, Sunnatun Mustahabbatun. And so he says that Atikaf is a Sunnah, and he also adds Mustahabba. And of course, Sunnah means Mustahabba. This is just giving it extra emphasis. And also, that's something, Sunnah is something that like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he did. And um, this is something the Prophet ﷺ at the beginning, he used to look for the Laylatul Qadr in the whole month of Ramadan. And then later, he w when he um, got revelation, he went to the last 10 days of Ramadan and only did it to have in the last 10 days. And that's, and that's where it was. And so when we talk about uh, Laylatul Qadr, Laylatul Qadr is somewhere inside the last 10 days. We don't know what, it, like the strongest of the opinions, we don't know uh, what exact day it is. Uh, and uh, also, we we would say that it can move from one day to another day, and it could, and it's probably it's more likely to be on the odd days than the even days. But it could be on any of them. And so, and if someone were to only choose one day, then they would choose the twenty seventh. Like if this was the only day that they were going to do, then choose the twenty seventh, um, because of the ha hadith that came in this in this meaning. And of course, this is something like um, that. Sometimes there'll be ambiguity in the in the Sharia to make us work harder. And this is of the things like if we all knew that it's the twenty seventh, then we just like chill out in the twenty seventh. All right, let's do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but. Um, no, but this is something like giving that last 10 days gives us an extra push in our ibadah and make us, uh, uh, make us think and try and seek for that night and work every single night to make sure that we get that, uh, that uh, the, the, uh, 
the night of uh, you know, uh, Laylatul Qadr, that we're standing up in that night praying and uh, and seeking Allah's favor in that night. And that ambiguity is, is something that, that is very um, beneficial for us. And the Prophet Sallallahu of course, in one of the hadiths, he, he was given the answer to like the secret. He was given the secret and he went out to the Sahaba to tell them the secret of the Laylatul Qadr. And when he went out to see them, there were some, some people that were bickering and fighting and arguing. And so after he got this uh, like settled, then he he forgot, and of course, like they, they like that whole situation made him forget. And of course, this is for wisdom that Allah um, led did. And of course, he never will. And the Prophet Sallallahu will never forget something that is important for us to know. And of course, if he forgot, it, this was something that was uh, of that. But he told them, I was I was going to tell you what when <laughs> Laylatul Qadr was, but uh, <laughs> he was caused to forget. Sallallahu uh, alaihi So this is something. Yes, there is uh, people that try to give like that one day, and they say this has got to be twenty seventh. You know, and yes, there are hadith that talk about this, but none of them are clear cut. And there's other hadith that also are that are strong evidence to show that's on another night than other than that. Whether it's the twenty fourth or whether it's the twenty first, there's there's other hadiths that point that, that it actually happened on one of these. So, um, so this is something Allah knows best. But of the fact that it could move around from one year to another, this is of the like the strongest opinion. Seeing that the evidence came in like these different days and whatnot. Allah Taala Allah. Uh, so he says here, as far as the etikaf, he says walahu shartani. And so of course etikaf. Uh, in general, uh, linguistically, it means like staying in one place, like muks. Um, it's like staying in one place. And so he says here, um, the uh, for it in the Sharia, he says, "Wanahu shartan." There's two conditions. One is the niyyah. So this is the first thing someone needs to have niyyah. And the second one, he says here, "Walubtu uh, fil masjid." So these are the two. And this is very simple for etikaf. He didn't also he didn't put a time period on this. He didn't say it needs to be for a certain period of time. It just needs to be for a period of time, like something that you would consider a period of time. Um, so um, this is this is the the important thing. Like in the Shafi'i Matam, it's very open. Like etikaf could happen between uh, uh, um, between like the ikama and the the salat itself. If you came early, you could you could say I am I'm intending uh, etikaf until like I pray this prayer. You know, you can have this intention and say to calf. Of course, you don't get the same reward as someone who did the whole day, of course. But it's it's something that's open, so you can have this intention to stay in the masjid. And this is a is this is an act of worship to have this intention of, of making a to calf. You can do the same thing whether it's from Maghrib to Aisha or any of these things. Uh, you can have this. It doesn't need to be a whole day, and it doesn't need to be a day that you fasted the day before or the day of, or while you're fasting. These are some of the conditions that some other madhabs put onto it. But the Shafi'i madhab is very open in this. That you just need to have the intention to stay in the masjid. And um, and to stay in the masjid, these two are the intention. Of course, if somebody uh, if somebody vows to do something, so if the person vows to do something, this thing all of a sudden takes a bunch of extra conditions that t- completes it as a full action. So if somebody vows to 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 pray, so and so and says, "Lillahi alayya an usalli," they just say it like that. Uh, that I uh, I vow to Allah that I that upon me is uh, um, to pray. So this person needs to pray. What is it? What are they going to pray? Do they do they pray one raka or two rakas, three rakas, four rakas, five? And they didn't say how many. Then we would take it on the closest amount that is that is obligatory, which is two. So we have uh, like uh, we have sub, and so we'd pray this with two rakas. So this person needs to pray two rakas for Allah. He can't just pray one of them. And he has to pray two, and he has to stand in it, and he can't sit in it even though he made it obligatory upon himself because this is now obligatory. So it takes extra conditions where something that's most to have would only have like just very loose, uh, it would have much uh, looser conditions. So in the same thing when it comes to someone, if someone vowed to, to do um, antikaf and they, they made this a vow, he, there's going to be extra conditions here. And so he says here, in, in regards to these extra conditions, وَلَا يَخْرُجُ مِنَ الْاَعْتِكَافِ الْمَنْظُورِ إِلَّا لِحَاجَةِ الْإِنسَانِ and so now he's talking about for this person, he says, um, so the, uh, he doesn't get out from the, like the person who does this. Uh, and al-mandur is the one that is promised, 
nadara mandur. That's the ism fa uh, maf'ul min nadara. And so like someone who, in, uh, who vowed to do this i'tikaf, then he doesn't leave it unless illa li hajatil insan. Unless it's for like a, a, like a human necessity or need. Um, such as eating, using the bathroom, um, you know, like uh, um, some of these things that are that have to be done for that that person. Um, then in this case, uh, he can leave for like eating and um, going to the bathroom and whatnot. These two, he can go. He can go out to his own house and use the bathroom in his own house, and he can um, go eat in his own house, and then he comes right back. So if he vowed to do this, he'd leave and go eat because you don't need to eat in the masjid. This is something that's not upon you to do this. And the same thing with um, using the restroom. Well, no one uses the restroom in the bathroom and of course, uh, in the masjid. No one uses the bathroom in the masjid. And of, of course, like the the buildings in America and whatnot, and in the West, they always put the bathroom inside the same building. But if you see here in Egypt, do you ever see bathrooms inside of the masjid here? You, if you ever think about it, you'll always see the bathroom is in a separate. It's in a separate like construction. Mm -hmm. This is of the. This is of like the. There, of course, you never should be using the bathroom in the in the masjid. So they make a separate uh, structure that is, like usually there'll be like an awning from the masjid that goes to another separate structure that comes under the awning a little bit, and then it's a separate st structure that is the bathroom. So you actually leave the masjid to go into the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so these are never the same thing. And of course, like uh, in America, they, they'll just transfer one building to another. So you wouldn't consider the bathroom in the masjid though, because of course no one's allowed to use the restroom in the masjid. The masjid has certain ahkam that is not suitable for a bathroom. So, um, so the person, if they need to go to the bathroom, they don't have to go to this bathroom. They can go to their, ba their bathroom at their home. There's no problem with that. And they can go home, use the bathroom and come back. So there's and even if their bathroom is far, you know they can go to the bathroom, but they shouldn't be making extra pit stops and all kinds of extra stuff and going out of the way uh, on the way back and forth. But if there's something like they see someone, they they um, they give salams and whatnot, have a little conversation, that's okay. But in the most part, like this person goes goes does what they need, or if they're eating, they can go home eat, and then they come right back. And also um, of the other things he says here, out um, and he also says like, a, or an excuse, like an invalid excuse uh, for the person who, um, that, uh, that he like made this a vow to do this. And so he says, so like a, an excuse such as like if a, if a lady, she intended to do this and then she became, uh, a, a, like her period came. Of course, like at this point, uh, we talked about before, of the things that are haram for someone on their menses is to stay in the masjid. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, of course, she's not going to do it to kaf while she's hired. And so she's going to come out and um, and then that, that like she has an excuse for that. And she can make up that day later if she, if there was like a certain amount of days that she, um, um, that she had like that, then she would do that in that way. But um, she has a valid excuse for that. Um, and or marad, and this is, of course, he said, and not just any sickness, but it's a sickness that you can't stay in the masjid with, such as someone has the runs or something of this sort. They can't stay in the masjid, so and it's going to be very hard for them to stay, as opposed to someone who, like, they maybe they just have a like a sickness with their like a, a limp and whatnot, but they can stay in the masjid. There's no problem with this, you know. If they were going back and forth, maybe it's hard, but like just to stay in the masjid, there's no problem. So in this case, it wouldn't be something. But if it was something that's hard for this person to stay in the masjid with it, then in this case, this is an, ex this is an excuse for him to break his um, vow or like to at least um, leave that and resume it when he can. You know, the last thing here he mentions is وَيَبْدُلُ بِالْوَطْوِ And so, and this also breaks uh, with, uh, with intercourse. And of course, um, the Allah says, وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ so this is like the, the basis for itikaf, this ayah here. One of it is la tubashiruhunna. And mubashara is the is kinaya for jima. Um, like of course when skin touches skin, going back and forth. This is a kinaya for like that, uh, that, that sexual intercourse. Uh, and also he says, wa antum akifuna fil masajid. And so that's of course itikaf here is mentioned and it's connected with the masjid. And also, um, so like can a woman, can she make itikaf in her prayer place at home? And this is a this is a this is a debated question, and the Shafi'i opinion is no, it needs to be an actual masjid. Like etikaf is for masjids only. It's mentioned with the masjid here, and it's all, and if you hear well akifina, this is watahir bait litta'ifin wal wal qaimina wal rukai sujud or the other one watahira bait litta'ifina wal akifina. 
And so uh, the Akifin, like the, the people are doing the Atikaf, that's in the, the Bayt al-Haram. Or that's always connected with the masjid. So this is the uh, this is important for our, in, like in the Shafi Madhab, it's the masjid is the only place that Arati Kaf is done. Wallah Yeah. So Allah Ta'ala so the itikaf, during the itikaf, so you say that intercourse will break the itikaf, sir. Mm -hmm. But the, pro the person is going back and forth during that time. If he has something with his wife, does that break the itikaf? If it's uh, if it's intercourse, it would break the itikaf. But if it's not intercourse, then it's best for him to leave it. Mm -hmm. Such as like kissing or making out or any of the other things. I like the muqaddimat. It's best for him to leave that because there's uh, there's a difference of opinion when it comes to this matter. But it's best for him to leave that. But um, say if he wasn't, this was a i'tikaf that was just a normal i'tikaf. It wasn't he didn't he didn't vow to do this, but he was intending to. So he goes out. He's still like he's intending to come back to finish his i'tikaf. So if he goes out and then all of a sudden, okay, he uh, he he does something with his wife. All right, and so at this point, it would break the i'tikaf, and when he comes back, he just renews his intention. But if he but if he intended to do this and then he went for his hajjat al insan and then he came back, it's as if he was there the whole time. Or he's getting rewarded all of that time for it to kaf. As opposed to someone who went and uh, did something with his wife and then came back. When he when he left and did something with his wife, then it broke the to kaf no longer is valid. Mm -hmm. You know, like from here on out it's done. Mm -hmm. And then if he goes back he, he starts it up again. So he misses that time. Uh, as opposed to the person who did it the whole time. Or had the intention and whatnot. <coughs> so is it only done? The takaf is done in the ten days, or it can be the whole month? It can be any time anybody wants at any time. So any time anybody wants uh, at any day, any time. Of course, the it's the sunnah is to do it at the last ten days. This is like the the, the sunnah that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to do, and also his wives did afterward, after him, uh, that they they would do this as well. Radhiallahu anhu. And so um, this is of the, and of course, looking for that uh, the Laylatul Qadr, and that's like the the point of that. But also like just the fact of someone staying in the masjid with the intention of worship. This is Atikaf. They have this intention. They're getting rewarded for it. And so, and of course, if, if anyone has like a uh, if anyone has like a regular routine of doing this, this is something that's great. Whether it's between one salat to another salat, and of course, this is, um, this is something that's good for people. And uh, whether it's just like they want to make sure a certain amount of um, days in the year they're doing this, this is great. You know, like there's nothing. Um, this is an act of worship, and um, people can and do this however they um, however they want to to make sure that they do it together. And this is great. And like some of the tablik members, they have their own kind of way they think they need to do it together every single. Every so often, they want to get forty days out of the year or something. Like the number itself is uh, like it's not prescribed the number, but like the fact that they're they're going at it, this is great, you know. And of course, this is it's always important to give uh, rights uh, like good, uh, like the rights where um, rights are due. And of course, like the the actions of like tablik, a lot of times they're they're actions that are inspiring people to do more acts of worship, and this is good. Of course, some of the like the numbers and whatnot. This is not part of the Sharia, so like we wouldn't necessarily hold on to the numbers with anything. But the the reinforcement to go do this, this is great. Some of the other things in there, that's a that's another um, deal when it comes to dawah and not talking about things of um, uh, like fiqh things or matters. This is a whole other thing. But um, there is a lot of good that um, they do, and of them is that they are calling to etikaf all the time, and this is a, this is something that they are known for doing. Uh, so the itikaf is not only necessarily done in Ramadan, it can be done anytime. Anytime, anytime that someone wants to, yeah. Any other questions? All right. So the author, after after we finished here, we're gonna start. Uh, he starts up with the last of the the five pillars of Islam, and so which is Kitab al-Hajj. So he says here the Kitab al-Hajj, and Hajj uh, linguistically it means gust. Or it's like, or like a lot of intention. So it's like meaning to do something. And so like, or like doing it over and over again. So like that repetition of doing that, that's something that's hajj. And, and also um, like Umrah is also included in this, uh, in this chapter because of its connection with it. It's like a mini hajj. In Umrah, ling linguistically, it means ziyarah. 
right? It uh, means like visitation. So, and these are these are two things that are um, that are going to be encompassed here. And also, like the in general, Hajj is something that's obligatory every single year for it to happen. It's a, a, it's obligatory fardu kifaya for it to happen. Whether like for people to be doing Hajj every single year, this is obligatory. And fardu uh, kifaya. Now, the people, he'll talk about them uh, for the individuals. What for an individual for it to become obligatory upon them? He'll give some of these um, examples here. And of course, there's other benefits to Hajj, such as people coming together and seeing, like, uh, and coming together for Hajj. Of course, at this one time of the year, all this amount of uh, uh, of Muslims from all over the world. This is this is a beautiful thing, and this is of the Sharia of Ibrahim, alayhi um, salam, that that is uh, with us even to this day, and also like. People going to Mecca and seeing it, this is of the benefits, you know, like you hear about the story uh, the story in the Seder of the Prophet Wasallam. but when you're there and you see the Kaaba and you see like the actual area and like the, the, the there's definitely something that brings it alive. It brings alive the stories that you heard. You're like, this is the place uh, where the Prophet Wasallam was praying. And then here, and then there's all the people of Mecca talking about him. You can like see that and you're there. You know, so of course this is, a, this is definitely great for someone to actually go there and see that. And also like the, the benefit of the benefits of it is like seeing the, the many people that are different, but all of them come together in a similar way when we all wear ikhram. The poor person and the rich person, they're about the same. When it comes to what they're wearing, they're the exact same. Like there's no difference. No one's putting on perfume. They're the same person's got the same hair that's a little um, messed up and whatnot. And um, no one's wearing anything on their head. None of this. Everyone's at the same level when they're doing Hajj. This is something that really like shows a, a level of equality. This is also something that really hit hard with Malcolm X. Malcolm X was very affected when he saw like the effect, or he saw Hajj when he went on Hajj. This is what actually made him Sunni, but and also gave him a real appreciation for Islam. Was that when he saw all of these people from all around the world, they're all the same. Like there's no difference. They're all wearing the same thing, all doing the same exact actions. You know, this is this was something that really affected him a lot. Um, and also, it reminds us of um, of the of the people that came before. Of course, like this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even before he was sent, he used to do Hajj. Even before he was sent as a prophet and became a prophet, he used to do Hajj. This was something that was known all the, all the way from the time of Ibrahim until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would do Hajj and they would all do Hajj. And of course, um, uh, he showed us how to do this in the proper um, uh, fashion uh, and uh, Hajjatul Wada. And, and so, and this is something that reminds us of that. And also, uh, um, it helps the poor people of Mecca. And there's also like, this is of those, there's certain acts of worship that are pointed towards like our mind, like learning and whatnot, learning Aqidah and um, learning Aydin, like uh, Ta'alam and whatnot. This is something that po it's pointed at like our, our mind and our Aql. And we, we use this in a way to worship Allah. And there's also like the, the mouth that we use to worship Allah when we're reciting Quran and when we're in Salah and we use some of our actions of the body. But when we look at Hajj, it encompasses all of these. It encompasses the mind. We have to learn how to do it. We also have to encompass the money that we have um, to, to actually afford the actual expenses to go there. It also encompasses the body itself because it's physically tasking. Like walking from one place to another, even just doing tawaf with how many thousands of people that are around and, and or doing the sa'i, that's hard enough. And then like um, the people that uh, walk all the way from, uh, from the Kaaba to like uh, Arafah, like of course this is a very long walk and it's tiring. You know, like so, like this is this is something that's like phys physically, it gets your your like your physical body is putting uh, is doing an act of worship with you putting out this effort and whatnot, and so this is um, definitely an uh, it shows like the the command or like the completion of like Islam when it reaches every single art aspect of the human, you know, like every single aspect of uh, humanity it reaches and this is, can be an act of worship for Allah, and um, this is this is of the beauty of Islam. So he says here, going to like what makes it obligatory for someone, uh, or like what are the conditions? Uh, he says shara itu wujub, uh, which are the conditions for it to become obligatory. And so uh, he says wa shara itu wujub al haji sabatu ashia. So like for it to become obligatory, there needs to be seven conditions that are met. These first three we talk about them every time, uh, which is al Islam, al bulug, wal aql. Like that he's a Muslim, and that he is his age of accountability, and then he also has um, that he's sane. Uh, and then the next one, hurriya. Of course, this is something that encompasses encompasses money. So how is somebody that is um, money himself? How is he supposed to to be unburdened to go on something that like takes a lot of money? 
So of course he, he's out off the hook here, but the person who has uh, money, of course um, the hur, uh, the person who is uh, free, and of course and he is uh, of the people that are obliged. And also he says, wa wujubu zadi wa rahila, and wujud, uh, wujud is zadi wa uh, rahila, which is the the presence like wujud uh, of zad, and zad is the things that someone needs when they're on their trip, such as food, uh, water, um, like all of the things that they need with their uh, to get there and to like uh, live and whatnot. This is the thing that is important for them, so that they have like their preparations with them. And what rahila? And rahila is the like the means of transportation. So like the the actual things that he needs on the trip, which is the z and also the transportation. Both of these are the are a condition uh, for it to become obligatory. These need to be available for him. So if they're not available for him, such as now a lot of times a lot of these packages and going there, it's like. What is it? Ten thousand, eleven thousand, twelve thousand? I don't know how many dollars, but it's it's very it's very expensive. So the person who doesn't have this this money, to, um, to, and also just like the actual, um, like the, just to get the permission to be in that place, um, to get that, um, yeah, that stamp and whatnot, that visa for Hajj, actually costs like a huge amount of money. So the person who can't pay for this, um, in this case, he's not obliged to to make Hajj until he has the financial ability to do that. Um, and so, this is of the things he needs to have this way to get there, uh, and nothing should be. And he says the next one here with tariq that the that the area, like the tariq, the road or the way to get there, is is something that isn't blocked by like whether it's by like robbers and whatnot or highway bandits or um, like by unsafe, like there's gonna be unsafe traveling or whatnot. That's that's ridiculous, um, and that so this is something that the the road needs to be clear of um, like major, major um, things that are unsafe. Uh, and also what imkan al masir. And so imkan al masir, which is like the ability to get there in time. So like if he's not able to get there before, say he's able to get there, but by the time he, now he has the money and by the time he gets the ticket, and the ticket is gonna get him there a little after um, Yom al uh, like Yom al Arafah is finished. So Bukuf al Arafah he's gonna miss it. So he doesn't have it. He's gotta be able to get there on time. If he doesn't have the ability to get there on time, then he's not able to do it. And so he's off the hook. And also there's another thing that he, he didn't uh, put in here, but that's important, is the ability to do it himself. Like the ability for him to make hajj. So if he's physically unable, but he's able with all the other things, then he sends someone on behalf with his money because it's like something that's a that's a right um, he needs to have it done but if he can't do it physically maybe he's physically enabled to do this he's he's um, disabled he's in a wheelchair and whatnot so this person can have send someone else he's still it's still upon him if he has the money it's upon him um, but he sends someone else to do it for him uh, in his in his case uh, and this is of the rare circumstances that someone can do your do your act of worship for you this is of the you can you can hire someone to do and to do a hajj for you in this case uh, and so these are the conditions if any of these are not met then this person is um, is not obliged to make hajj uh, and so also of the conditions as well if someone did um, like if we had a kid that did hajj then his hajj would not be counted for him unless he did it while he so he needs to do one while he's a uh, while he's balik so if he did before he's balik that hajj is yeah he gets rewards but it's not counted for him until he's bedek. And also, of the things, um, is is Hajj the only one that is fard, or is also Umrah fard? And um, the the Shafi method is that the Umrah is also fard. It's obligatory on every single person to to make Umrah as well. So it's not just Hajj that is obligatory on every person, but also Umrah is obligatory on every person that's able to do it at least one time. Uh, so these two, both of them need itmam, which is like completion. And that completion in, entails starting it. So um, so these, both of these um, need to be done. And this is something oftentimes a lot of people, they think only hajj is the only one because it's of the, the five arkan. But no, umrah is also obligatory for someone to do at least one time in their, in their lifetime. Wallah uh, ta'ala a'lam. And so this is, uh, so these are the abilities. And of course, like for, for Omar, someone can do this at much easier. This is much easier for someone to get in there and do that. And so the next thing he's going to talk about, he's going to talk about the Arkan of Hajj. And so he says that there's, uh, there's five Arkan. Arkan wal Hajji Khamsatun. And so there's five Arkan uh, for uh, five pillars for Hajj. And so he's going to give these and 
the, the order is, is somewhat important and we'll talk about some of them in detail and some of them we'll, we'll go back to when it comes into uh, when it comes into it. So the first one is Al-Ihram, uh, Ma'aniyah. And so this is the first one. And so Al-Ihram, like comes like, of course, Ihram is like Duhul. Sometimes you'll have the Ifan, or uh, means like entering into something, entering into a certain place. Uh, and so this, this here, Ihram is like entering into a state of making things haram that normally are halal. Um, so normally you would be able to you would be able to pluck some of your hairs or like you'd be able to pull your hairs or, or comb it and you know hairs are gonna uh, jump off and whatnot. But normally you'd be able to put on um, cologne or put on all kinds of scents and whatnot. Normally you can wear like a coat and whatnot and wear boxers and, and all of these other things that uh, people would normally wear. But when you come into ihram, these things that are normally halal for you. There's certain things that become haram now because you've come into this state, uh, and so this is of the uh, of the things we'll talk about ihram in detail at the end. Of, there'll be an actual chapter where we talk about all the things, the do's and don'ts of ihram, and this is very important. Of course, someone who's spending lots of money to go to Hajj or to go to Umrah, they should at least do the the spending of time to learn how to make it valid. You know, like so they're not doing things that that are breaking their or like uh, that are that they have to pay a price, you know, for breaking these things of Hajj because they didn't learn. And so, so Ihram is, a, is like that state of being that the person comes into. And of course, it, he comes into it, Ma'aniya. So with the niyyah is when it starts. And so, of course, it also needs to be at the Miqat. And he'll talk about this later of the things that are wajib. He says, Arkan. And he also is going to talk about wajibat. Then he's going to talk about mustahabat. And so these are, this is the way it's kind of broken on. And if you look at the... Um, if you look at the Salah, the Salah has its own breakdown of what we call things. And this, a lot of times, certain actions of worship will have a breakdown in what we call it with the Mustalah. So he will have Arkan, and then we'll have the Wajibat, and then we'll have the other things. And of course, uh, technically, when we talked about what is Wajib, it's anything that you're called to do, and that if you don't do it, there's a, there's a threat of, uh, of uh, retail, or like a punishment for it. And here in Hajj, of course, like Fard, uh, the fard or the arkan is obligatory, but also the wajib is also obligatory as well. But the fard, if it doesn't, if you don't come with the arkan, then your hajj is not valid. But as opposed to the wajib, if you if you break one of these wajib, may, there's something you can do to make up for it. So that's why this is uh, there's a difference. And sometimes you'll also see this with, um, uh, like in the in the salah, we have the arkan, which are obligatory for someone to do, um, and then we have the mustahabat and whatnot. But in like the like the the hanbalis, they have the they have the arkan, and then they have the wajibat in their salah. Which are like things that they have to do, and if you don't do it, then you have to do sujood sahu for it. But um, this is similar here, where we have the wajibat and we have the arkan. So the arkan, we we have to do them. And so the first one, which is ihram, it needs to be done with the niya, and the time for this is before the miqat, and or at the miqat, like uh, any time before or up to the miqat, it needs to be done. And if somebody uh, meets that miqat, like that place uh, when when coming in, if they go past it. Uh, without making uh, ihram, then they need to go back to it if they can. And if they don't, then they they missed one of the wajibat. So then they would have to they would have to uh, they would have to slaughter something on behalf of that for that that mistake that they made. But so it needs to be at the miqat. And of course, anyone who's flying in, like from anything on Jeddah, they'll tell they'll tell you if you're flying into Jeddah, they'll tell you we're coming up on the miqat. So make that make sure you go into ihram. Of course, uh, you go into ihram with the niyyah, and of course, it's sunnah to say labbaik uh, alahum labbaik, and so like to, to go into the talbiyah with this, uh, or to say hajj or umrah when someone goes into this. But they can do the ihram from their from their house if they want to do ihram early. Of course, uh, this is this is uh, extra hardship, um, but like uh, the sunnah is to do it at the miqat or at the level of something that's like it. So this is the first uh, of the pillars here, is the mika, or is the ihram with the niya, and this is what enters someone into that. And then after that, the next of the, the pillars for hajj is wukuf, wal wukuf bi arafa. And so and he says here the wukuf, which is standing, and arafa. And arafa is a is not just the actual mountain itself, but it's like the plain around it is also a part of that, uh, what would be called arafa. And this is on the, <coughs> from, it's from Dhuhr, Yom Tasa, from his, uh, so the ninth day from Dhuhr until Fajr. 
in the, in the night day of the Hajjah, uh, from Dhuhr until Fajr, they, the person needs to have been there on there at least a, like a lahda, like some type of time where they were standing on Arafah from that time. So they need to have made uh, Wukuf bil Arafah. And this is the, the most time sensitive part of Hajj. So the person that does this, even if he made a bunch of other mistakes, but he got there, you know, like uh, this is this is the, the main thing. Without it, there's not going to be a hatch. So, uh, and this is also the differentiating factor uh, with a lot of, uh, if you were to take the arkan of hajj and umrah, the only difference between them is wukuf uh, al-arafah. It's all the same arkan. And so then after the wukuf bil-arafah, uh, which is um, standing on arafah from that time mentioned there, uh, is tawaf and bil bait, and this is tawaf al ifada, and this is done after after wukuf bil arafa. Then you would go to uh, you would go and make tawaf after standing on arafa, and and this is um, the tawaf al uh, ifada. It's called uh, al ifada, and this is, this comes from like the ayah of what Allah says, what wal yatawafu bil bait al atiq. And so, like this, uh, this is like the Mufassirin, They always say that, that this this ayah here is referring to tawaf a tawaf bil bait. And there's an interesting uh, concept that occasionally you'll have something well yet tawafu bil baitil atiq. And so we have this this amr that comes in here. So we have this amr that's obligatory for us to do. But when is this obligatory? Like, how do we get this from this ayah? And something that the the Shafis they'll look at is when we have some of these amr, like this amr comes into the into the Quran. And we don't know when is the time that it's obligatory. We know it's obligatory, the, the amr, yaktad al wujub. So we don't know when it's obligatory. So we look at some of the things, when is it obligatory? Then when we see when this is obligatory, we say this is where it's talking about. Like this is the, the part that's obligatory. It becomes specific in one area, but this has got to be obligatory somewhere. Um, and so this is also of the evidence used for, um, for the salah. Uh, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like when someone does this, uh, that when is this obligatory? And so this is the when is this obligatory? Uh, the Shafis, they'll point, say this is the Amr, Yaktadi Wujub, and that Wujub uh, is when does this Wujub, uh, what is it talking about here? It's talking about it in Salah, at the end of the Salah. Like this is when it's obligatory for us to say this as part of the arikan in salah. And so they'll do this. And the same thing here. There's a, a little benefit um, in usul, and occasionally this will come up. And this is of them, like this tawaf, because there's many tawaf. And this is the one that's, uh, that's obligatory for the, the hajj. Uh, and so the person who's doing hajj, he has to do that. Um, and this is the after, after he comes back from Arafah, then he would make the tawaf al ifadah And until he does this, he can't, uh, uh, he can't leave his hajj. Like he needs to do this, this tawaf. Uh, in this uh, and so also of the things for tawaf uh, I, I just mentioned there's a, all the conditions for salah are the same for tawaf like so we have to except that he can talk and whatnot um, because the Prophet said um, that that it's like the a tawaf is like salah except that uh, talking is permissible so the person who is doing tawaf he should he should make it it's salah it's a salah and it's an act of worship. And so he also needs to make sure that he's covering his aura, which is from the belly button to the knees. All of this is covered. None of it can be uncovered during that, or else that tawaf, that, that circuit that he was in, this is no longer valid if he, if he doesn't have his aura covered during this time. And this is, occasionally it can be an issue, you know, like just um, from the, from like all the people coming back and forth. So it's important that someone, they, they make sure that they're covering their aura. And some people, they wear their, um, they wear like the, the cloth at the bottom, uh, they'll wear it low, where it's below their belly button. And this is invalid, like they're invalidating their tawaf because they're not covering their aura. Besides the fact that it's haram to show this without a like a, a purpose, um, then that they're invalidating tawaf, this is, uh, this is a problem. And so it's important that someone has their aura covered as well as they're in a state of wudu. They have wudu and they're in a state of purity. Um, this also needs to be done when someone's doing it. So of course it's counterclockwise. And you would start up from the, the black rock. So you'd have the, the black rock, that, that stone that's on that, um, that one corner. And then you'll have, there'll be a green light that shows, um, like they have there at the, the Kaaba. They have a green light. So you'd make sure you're between the black rock and the green light. You need to make sure that you're before it. 
because if you start after it, you no, know, you need to start before this, uh, for this, and then you would make sure that you have it, that you're before it, and then you would raise your right hand and say Allahu Akbar Bismillah, and then you start. And then there's there's seven seven uh, rounds that you would do, and you need to keep track and make sure that you have uh, you keep track of all of these rounds that you do. And of course, there's there's other Sunnah that are involved. Uh, uh, and but of course, of the things to keep in mind when someone is going and doing any of these things in um, Hajj or in Umrah as well, um, to make sure that none of the sunnahs that they try to accomplish are accomplishing a greater harm on their neighbors. So occasionally there will be people that they they want to go kiss the black rock and whatnot, but they ended up giving elbows, elbowing women in the face, and I don't know, uh, wallahi, <laughs> like I don't know how much harm. They cause trying to do this, yeah. and so of course, like this is, like this is this is you're never going to be getting close to Allah with something that makes them upset, and, and like harming Muslims is like haram, 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 and so you're never if you're going to have a, a, a if it's between harming Muslims or doing something you think is sunnah, then you don't do that thing. You, you don't harm the Muslims, and you don't go off and, and doing this. But the, the Asif Shadid, there's, there's these guys that are huge, and they just... Yeah. Sorry. And um, so it's very important that we never harm anybody. And, um, and there'll never be a time that harming someone is prescribed unless you're in jihad, you know, like, or like there's this actual thing. You'll never be uh, put in a position where you need to harm somebody to do something that's sunnah, you know, uh, Allah Mustafa. So, uh, and of course, like having the best manners, this is of the things that's very important when someone is in, in these big, uh, uh, like a big a group of people, that they're always working on having the best manners that they can with their people. And this is of the things that will, that will put people ranks, uh, ranks up in Jannah, is having good manners and etiquette with people. Uh, and may Allah make us of the people that have good manners. And so this is um, Tawaf in, in general. Of course, he needs to make seven times. And if he's unsure of how many times he did, he doesn't know if it was three or four, he goes with the lesser number, just like in Salah. So if he's going and he forgot, is this six or is it five? It's five. <laughs> and even if he does extra, then he does what he knows. He, he bases off of that. And it's best for someone to, to be mindful, you know, how they do this. I, don't, I know everyone forgets how many times at, <laughs> if, it's six, <laughs> if it's six or seven. And you know it's six in this case, um, so it's important that someone counts while they're doing this as well. And then it's also sunnah for somebody at the end to um, <coughs> to, to do two rakahs afterwards. And this uh, this would be behind the maqam Ibrahim. Um, and so and this doesn't necessarily doesn't need to be directly behind it. If there's if there's zahma, like if there's lots of people, then you'd go you'd go somewhere behind it behind it where you're not in anybody's way. Of course, memorize uh, remembering. And the fact you're never harming somebody while you're while you're here to do a sunnah like that sunnah is never going to be harming somebody, um, and if there if you had the intention to do a sunnah but that's going to come at the expense of hard, of harming somebody, you are leaving that sunnah for that sake, inshallah you'll get rewarded for that sunnah and you'll get uh, rewarded for not harming that person uh, with that intention. So you'll never be missing out on reward for the for not making a, one of these sunnah. But of course have the intention so that you don't miss out on that. Does that also uh, involve uh, the wajibat? Uh, for harming people, you, like the wajibats, you can do this without harming people. Yes, of course, there's going to be like you're going to be a part of the the crowd, but of course, you do this in a way that's not harming people. No, I mean just like generally as a as a person. There's some there's some aspects where yes, where like if it comes to to some things, but it's not. Uh, it's kind of a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. um, so. <clears throat> and so then after we have we have the tawaf and we do the two rakahs afterwards and then we go to uh, sai uh, we do the sai bina safa wal marwa and so and these are uh, and of course everything is is labeled in the in the haram and so someone if they go there they can see that there'll be a little place where they say masha uh ni safa wal marwa and so people can go there and then you start up on safa uh, as safa and then you would start from there and you would go down and of course, there's there's du'a to do at the while you're standing at, when you start, and at the uh, at each side there's du'a uh, for someone to do adhkar um, for that. And of course, having lots of um, du'a the whole time is is important. And then also when someone is coming down and they'll go to the other side and come up, on the way they'll be they'll have like a, there's a certain area where it's uh, where it's like the harwala 
for someone to to kind of jog kind of uh, faster than walking. You know, like walk very fast or kind of like that little jogging uh, between the the one place to the other. And this is uh, they'll have lights there, like green lights that tell you the place where you should be doing. It. And you'll see people doing it, uh, inshallah. So and this is a place where it's soon enough for someone to to kind of uh, run a little bit from one place to the other, and then you will come back and you come up and come back and forth. And all of this will be seven, and each one to the other side is one. So you'll end up on the opposite side. So you'll end up on Marwa at the end of seven. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you end up on the other side. Uh, and the other, the other condition for Sai, uh, for this uh, Sai, is that it needs to be after Tawaf. You can't do it beforehand. Like this order is important. That someone does the, the sai um, in this in this order and that they don't go um, they don't do this beforehand, um, before tawaf. And this is this is for both um, for uh, for both Umrah and Hajj, Hajj and Umrah. And so then the last thing that he mentions here of the, the Sai is he says, Well Halq. And so halq is um, and this is also like it can be halq is like of course like shaving. And so if someone only cuts a little few hairs, this does it as well. Like, and just even cutting like three hairs, cutting three hairs, okay. This person, um, this, is, this is good enough for them to, to consider halk. And so these things need to be done. And he says, uh, uh, these, these are the five pillars of hajj that must be done. And, <clears throat> and this would be after like the time for this in hajj. Uh, it would need to be after the night of uh, uh, Laylatul Nahr, so it would need to be after that, uh, after that time for the for the halq, uh, Allah Taala. And so the the next thing he's going to go into is going to go into the arkan al umrah, and this is simple. It's everything that we just talked about, except for um, he says here arkan al umrah arba, uh, except for al al arafa. That's the only thing that's different. He says al ihram. This is what we already talked about. At Tawaf, we talked about this. As Sa'i, and, and this, and we talked about this. This is afterwards. The order needs to be done this way. And also, he says, "Well, halq awit taksir ala ahli al qawlain." And then he says also in halq and taksir, and one of the the two the the two al uh, qawlain, which is of the two views of Imam Shafi. And this is the the prop the the right view is that this is something that's a part of the arkan. Um, and occasionally uh, I'll, I'll point it out, but there's a couple issues um, with the with the matan when it comes to some of the things in Hajj, and I'll point it out that there's some some mistakes, or I wouldn't say necessarily mistakes, but it, he would use the the weaker view when it came when it comes to the Shafi'i method. So some of the views he he used one of the views of the, the Shafi'i method that is weak. And the stronger view is the is different, and this is of the views that is this is the strong view that he mentions. He mentions that there's two views here, um, and so yeah, this is of the way that someone comes into like the that they come into the they finish they finish Umrah by by halq or taksir. Of course, halq is better, like the actual shaving shaving. This is the best, and, and this comes from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu um, said, "Anhum arham al muhalliqin," and then they said to him, "Well, mukassirin ya Rasulullah." Like to add, add, add this as well. Uh, and then the Prophet Sallallahu repeated again, al humar hamil muhallikin. And then they said, wal muqassirin ya Rasulullah. Trying to get like the extra. And he said, uh, then he says three times. He said this three times. And then he said after the third time, and call it wal muqassirin. And so, like, so yes, giving it to him, but also this shows the importance. Of these people had three times that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, asked uh, for them to to have mercy on them, and then he also added at the last time for the muqassirin. So this, of course, is it's benef it's more beneficial for someone to actually do the full halk, and also like the actual. Um, this is for men only, and not for women. Women are never supposed to do halk. Like uh, this is not um, never pres prescribed for women, and um, this is the. Uh, and also for men in general, it's never prescribed for a man to like shave his head and go bald. Like skinhead is not something that's prescribed other than this case. Like this is the only time that it's prescribed for someone to actually shave their head all the way. Any other time, like they can do it and this is normal as long as they're not going against any like um, ada. But it's not like something that's sunnah for someone to shave their head or whatnot. Um, this is something that they can do according to like the ada of the people around them. Uh, it's best for someone not to go against the like the, the flow of the people that are around them um, that are like them. And, but other than that, this is the, the only place that is prescribed. Um, yeah, for someone to actually shave their head. Wallah ta'ala
Inshallah, we'll, we'll stop here and then we'll, we'll pick up here in the, in the next class. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashamu la ila ila anta wa astaghfiru wa tabidu. Falidhalika fad'u wa astaqim kama umirta wa la tattabi' ahwa'ahum wa qul amatu bima anzala Allahu min kitab wa umirtu li a'dil baynakum Allahu rabbu Thank you.